All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this very important day of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. In a moment, we're going to start our annual lecture, How Healers Became Killers, Nazi Doctors and Modern Medical Ethics, which will be followed at one o'clock by an interdisciplinary panel discussion on professional complicity. I'd like to stand, extend a special welcome um, to students in the audience of all disciplines. We strongly feel that this history is very important for those entering so many professional fields, including health sciences, law, and those seeking to be journalists or religious leaders in the future. This program is made possible by the Dr. William S. Silvers Holocaust Genocide and Contemporary Bioethics Endowment and Program Fund, and is also co-sponsored today by the fellowships at Auschwitz for the study of professional ethics or the FASB program. So thank you to our program sponsors. Today's programs are being recorded and they will be posted to our website, coloradobioethics.org, where you can view past programs and learn about our many upcoming events, including a Zoom program on February 13th, which may be of particular interest to this audience with our Helen Morris American Jewish Experience in Medicine program on Nuremberg Memories and the Founding of American Bioethics. With that, I'd like to introduce today's featured presenter. Dr. Matt Winia is the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. His career has included developing a research institute and training programs focusing on bioethics, professionalism, and policy issues at the AMA Institute for Ethics and founding the AMA Center for Patient Safety. He has led projects on a wide variety of topics related to ethics and professionalism, including medicine and the Holocaust with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and inequities in health and healthcare. Dr. Winia is a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and has chaired the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association or APHA. He is also currently a member of the Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust, Historical Evidence impl Implications for Teaching Today and Tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Winia. Thank you to those who are here in person. It's a different experience, obviously. Um, the last couple of years I've been giving this talk uh, just by Zoom, um, which is easier because I have notes in front of me when I'm doing Zoom talks. And today I will do this note-free or virtually note-free. Um, my colleague, uh, Patricia Haber-Rice, who's senior historian at the Holocaust Museum, gives a similar talk and she always starts by saying, um, this is a story about medicine betrayed and perverted by a notorious dictatorship. And there is a lot of truth to that statement. Um, I think it is also the case that this is our story. This is the story of how we got the ethics that we have today. Um, it's a story in which not only the Nazi doctors were implicated. And so um, what I'm going to do today is just tell the story. Um, I believe that there is no feature of modern medical or public health or nursing or pharmacy or dental ethics. All are um, affected. They're all sort of baked in this history. Um, but I'm not gonna, as we go through, try to draw those lines. Uh, they're difficult lines to draw. Um, instead, I'm just gonna kind of tell, tell what happened. And then at the end, I'll come back and talk about some kind of broad themes that I think are illuminated by this history, but no easy answers come out of this history. Um, it is comforting to believe that our ethics in healthcare are uh, immutable, that they are 2,000 years old since the time of Hippocrates, that they have been unchanging since then, that we have always known what our core values are. And yet, um, as you all know, in the time of the Nazi era, uh, that whole 
idea was really um, put to the test and failed. Uh, our, our values can change. They did. Our core ethics can change. They did. And a few doctors, this is an image from the Nuremberg doctors trial. A few doctors were brought to justice after the war, but most were not. The vast majority of people who were involved in these programs were never brought to justice. They went on to ongoing careers in medicine after the war. And there was a, a long period of time in which people didn't want to really talk about this history very much. Um, so what I'm going to dive into today is difficult. There's a reason we didn't want to talk about this. And before I start, I have an intentionally blank slide because... Um, I feel like there are uh, tripwires in this kind of a talk that don't exist in many other talks that I give. And I almost every, right, I'm in ethics. Every talk I give it has tripwires. If there's not something controversial, it's not an ethical issue. But this talk is different in two ways, uh, one personal and one professional that I think are worth being explicit about before we get started. The, the personal way is, you know, people in this room, people online, many of you give talks. So you know that if you are giving a talk, it is very possible that someone in the room will know more about whatever you're talking about than you do. This happens, whatever you're talking about, right? There could be someone who's written a book on the topic that you're talking about. So that doesn't bother me that much. I'm used to people in the audience possibly knowing more than me about the topic. Um, but this is different because there are people, including people both in the room and certainly people online, who own this history in a way that I never will because I'm not Jewish, I'm not German, right? This is not my family history. And yet, I also, um, in my time working with the museum, have really come to believe that we all somehow have to figure out how to own this history. Um, and, in, and in fact, it's a little unfair to leave the task of remembrance of this particular history to the groups most victimized in this time frame. It, it wasn't Jewish people who created the Holocaust, and yet it's the Jewish community that is often burdened with the activities of remembrance. There's no way to avoid that, but I think the rest of us have to figure out how to wrap our minds around the fact that this is our collective history. It's not just Jewish history. But that's the personal aspect. The professional one is, if anything, even more difficult because I think this topic is almost impossible to actually learn from. If I do a good job of explaining how Nazi doctors came to believe what they did and do what they did, it will start to sound like I'm making excuses for Nazi doctors. And if I try and draw a comparison between something that happened then and something that's happening now, that's called playing the Nazi card. And it's likely to close everyone's minds rather than opening them up, right? It's hard to learn once you've invoked the Nazis. It makes whoever's doing this thing today, they're just gonna be defensive, right? What they're doing is not what the Nazis did. And that's, and that's true, right? I mean, we have, we have scandals today. Um, I will tell you there is no research ethics scandal today that comes close to intentionally infecting a young girl with typhus and waiting until she dies and then killing her healthy twin so that you can compare their organs, right? That is not happening today. And yet, Somehow we have to figure out how to learn from this history. As horrible as it is, as incomparable as it is, our 
task is to figure out how to derive lessons from this history that can help us both understand where we are today and how we got here and how to build a better future. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this story. And again, I'm not gonna draw direct parallels or conclusions about how to think about things today, but I want everyone to try to start with an open mind that we can not just learn about this history, but learn from this history. So the, the question in the talk is how did healers become killers? And if you really wanna understand this, um, you have to go back well before the Nazi era. Um, you have to go back uh, at, whoops, you, you have to go back considerably further. And well, sorry, I got the slides backwards here, but um, I'll just say uh, one of the things that's going to come up as we go through this is this notion, uh, which is quite disturbing, that um, without doctors and nurses and other health professionals' participation, the Holocaust itself might not have happened. And that's a, that's a bold and undoubtedly historically not correct assertion. Because after all, Hitler didn't need doctors to become anti-Semitic, right? He had anti-Semitism. They were killing people with bullets before they were killing them in gas chambers. But it is almost an inevitable thing to start thinking about as you go through this history. And that's what this slide is about here. I'm not the first person to make this observation. In fact, this observation was very early made after the war. This is Andrew Ivey at the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial. So 1946, 47, where he is saying that without physician involvement, without nurse involvement, that this whole idea of death factories might not have arisen. Um, this is the slide to sort of take us back and to go, get well before uh, the Nazi era. Um, in fact, I, th I think it's worth going all the way back to Plato. Plato wrote about um, having good quality children. And if you had poor quality children who were not part of the, the guardians breed, right? The high end breed of human being, that those children could actually be left outside the gate to die. That idea is the core idea of eugenics. They didn't call it eugenics back then, but eugenics is a pretty simple notion at its root, right? It's the idea of selective breeding. If you can breed for a faster horse or a stronger ox, you can breed for a better human being. And if you do that enough, you will create a better class or race of human being. The core principles of eugenics are usually broken into these two frames. One is positive eugenics, which is where you find a group of people or a type of person that you want to reproduce, you want more of them. And so you encourage those people to reproduce and negative eugenics, which is defining those who are less valuable, whom you don't want to have more of, and you discourage them from reproducing. And the idea here is that over time, you will end up with a stronger, smarter, healthier, longer living, whatever you're breeding for, right? That's the idea. This had a rebirth at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, when Mendelian genetics, which is a very simplified understanding of genetics, but Mendel's work is being rediscovered at this time. And Francis Galton takes his cousin Charles Darwin's work and the notion of social Darwinism is born. Um, this is, a, as a colleague Paul Ruolpi has said, eugenics is an elegant theory. It's incredibly appealing. It, it explains so much about science, about uh, society, right? It's, it, it's very um, attractive. Um, Carl Pearson, some of you might know that name from the Pearson Chi-Square Test, 
Um, Pearson is a very influential thinker at this time. His book, The Grammar of Science, was the first one that Albert Einstein assigned to the Olympia Academy when he started that in New York in the early 1900s. So very influential books. And you'll notice he's talking here as though, A, races are genetic and immutable. So even if you take someone from an inferior race and lift them up in one generation, the next generation, you'll have to make that investment again because they will inevitably revert to their genetic makeup, their racial makeup. And I'll notice also that the notion of the Aryan race as a race and as a superior race is well established already in 1901 when Hitler is 12 years old. The first eugenics conference takes place again well before the Nazi era in 1912. And you'll notice if you, if you recognize some of the names on this list, they probably are not the Nazis like Ernst Rudin. They're probably people like William Osler or Winston Churchill or Leonard Darwin or Alexander Graham Bell. And this conference um, was reported out. And I think this is maybe the most uh, stark illustration of the degree of both belief in eugenics and the clear falseness of it uh, with what we know today. This diagnosis, feeble-mindedness, is not even a medical diagnosis, right? But it was believed at the time as a diagnosis. And not only that, but Punnett, um, Alfred Punnett, by the way, uh, you might recognize that name, Punnett Squares. You remember high school biology? So Punnett believed if you could just stop people with feeble-mindedness from reproducing, within a couple generations, we would have no more feeble-minded people. So this is the simple understanding of genetics that leads to eugenics. Um, this is not primarily a German invention. That conference was held in London. Uh, there were a series of these conferences held around the United States, the first in Battle Creek, Michigan, the home of Kellogg's, because Kellogg was a famous eugenicist. So uh, Kellogg, Davenport, uh, Victor Vaughn, Booker Washington. Maybe the name here that's most important for our story is Harry Laughlin. Harry Laughlin writes a model law which is eventually implemented in a number of US states. Um, and it is a law allowing for the forcible sterilization of individuals who are of inferior genetic quality. And I'm keeping that in scare quotes. This was very widely discussed at the time. It never became in the US um, a, a uniformly agreed thing. Uh, eugenics continued to be debated but it was very common. This is a book I found at a used bookstore a few years back um, where you could invite one of the members of the medical society leadership at the AMA or your state medical society to come and give a talk at your local church or school or whatever, you know, community group. And these talks, if you just look through, this is 1913, if you just look through, these talks are loaded with people who are giving talks about eugenics and race hygiene and the mixing of the races, right? So this is Colorado, because here we are in Colorado. Um, and Dr. Corwin will talk about eugenics and how it's going to save the United States from you know, the waves of immigration, which people are very afraid of because it's going to dilute the racial pool in the US. Um, the US, of course, was a leader worldwide in taking race and the ideas about race and putting them into policy context, right? So we had anti-miscegenation laws for generations before the Germans ever thought about whether it was okay or not okay for people from different so-called racial backgrounds to marry each other and have children. And in fact, when the Nazis come to power, all of the states in yellow and red have laws preventing the marriage of black people and white people, which means they all have ways of defining who counts as a black person. 
and who counts as a white person? This is a question the Nazis have to figure out because they have to decide who's going to count as a Jewish person and who counts as a not Jewish person. And so they send a delegation to the United States and they, they travel around and they look at these laws and they try to decide, can we adopt some of what the US has done? And as probably many of you know, these laws are often one drop laws. Meaning if you have any black people ever in your history, you are black. One drop of black blood taints your entire lineage right, from there on out. And the Nazis looked at this and said, that's too extreme. We can't tell someone who had a Jewish great-grandfather, but all the rest of their, right? So they, when the Nuremberg Laws are adopted in 1935, which define who counts as Jewish and who counts as non-Jewish, you have to have three grandparents who are Jewish in order to be counted as fully Jewish. If you have two, you're mixed. So the US law that probably had the most influence on Nazi racial policy was not explicitly about race, it's about eugenics. It's explicitly about sterilization. So Harry Laughlin's model law uh, implemented in California ends up being implemented in Germany very early in the Nazi regime. So. Hitler comes to power in January of 33, July of 33, they pass uh, a law for the prevention of uh, progeny with hereditary diseases. And they base it on this American law in part because America's laws had been going through the ringer for 25, 30 years by this point, right? So the first American uh, law allowing for forcible sterilization was in 1907 in Indiana. That law went back and forth in the courts. It was repealed and then brought back. So they had, if you will, knocked out the kinks and figured out a way to frame these laws with uh, sort of due process provisions and so on that would meet constitutional muster. And in 1927, there is an explicit a bringing of this law to the Supreme Court to make sure that it can be implemented across the United States. And the Supreme Court agrees. The famous quote or infamous quote from this uh, case is three generations of imbeciles are enough. But I highlighted the sentence before that as well because I, I want to keep in our minds that these laws are based in notions of public health. They're based in medical notions. These are not pure social policy. They are, they are medical public health policy. So the law as it was implemented in Germany allows for forcible sterilization with this set of, of conditions. And of course, you'll notice hereditary feeble-mindedness is on this list, and that's where most of the people sterilized come from, because that's the category that is the most vague, the most nebulous. It allows you to sterilize people who are petty criminals or truants or women who have had children out of wedlock. The you can call almost, and that's what that's where Carrie Buck was sterilized as well, right? It was hereditary feeble-mindedness. Carrie Buck, by the way, the subject of that prior slide, um, was not feeble-minded. People who interviewed her later in her life um, did not find her to be feeble-minded whatsoever. Um, she had probably been raped by a cousin of the family that she was foster that being risen by her foster family and uh they couldn't accept that and so they said she was promiscuous um but she was married her entire life uh after this so it's a it's an elastic category that allows you um to put people in who are just socially uh vulnerable the um the Germans implement this law in a very aggressive way. They set up about 250 of these hereditary health courts around the country. The hereditary health courts are to uh, are where people are reported who are deemed by usually by their doctor or a nurse midwife as being 
needing sterilization in order to protect the community. Um, and they have uh, two doctors and one jurist. So the decision-making authority is essentially with the doctors unless a tie needs to be broken, in which case it goes to the, the jurist who would end up breaking the tie. They implement this law very aggressively over um, about 70 years in the US from 1907 until the 1980s. Uh, the US will forcibly sterilize about 70,000 people. In Nazi Germany in about five years, they sterilize 400,000 people in a country a third the size of the US. So they're very aggressive and American uh, eugenicists think this is a great thing, that they are setting the path that we all should follow. Um, the question of course arises almost immediately, if you think there's a group of people who ought not to have babies because those babies will be born uh, with disabilities that the state will then have to pay for, what happens when such a baby is born? And the answer, it almost answers itself. The answer is that baby should be gotten rid of before it gets too big. And Carl Brandt, this is a quote from Carl Brandt, uh, you have to take everything he says at the Nuremberg trial with a grain of salt. He is a giant grain of salt. He is the chief defendant. He was Hitler's personal physician, uh, among other roles. And he lies a lot at the doctor's trial. But his description of this is that a baby had been born to a family named Nauer, and the Nauers had actually asked Hitler if it would be okay for them to get permission to put their child out of its misery. And Hitler sends a, a delegation down to look and see what's going on. And, and Brandt says, we thought it was okay to, to kill this child, but we didn't think it was okay to make the parents be the ones who made that decision. We felt like the state, the doctors should make that decision. This program, um, is the first mass murder program of the Nazis. It precedes uh, the Shoah, it even precedes the war, um, but it precedes the Holocaust itself by about two years. Um, the so-called child euthanasia program uh, will kill about 5,000 children at least. That's the sort of low bound of the estimate. And it's children who are born with those conditions. The parents are typically deceived by being told their child is being sent to a specialized treatment center. There are about 35 of these treatment centers. And you put that in scare quotes. When the Nazis say special treatment, it is never a good thing. These special treatment centers are places where the child is received and then is either starved to death or sometimes killed by a direct injection of phenol to the heart. The parents are not told this, they're told that the child is doing well and then that they've taken a turn for the worse and now they have pneumonia and then they die. The deaths are recorded usually as pneumonia. Um, brain samples are taken for scientific research on whatever the condition is that they believe the child might have had. I put this in quotes, of course, euthanasia, because this is not euthanasia, right? This is a murder program of unwilling victims, both the children, of course, who are too young, um, but even of the parents. This program, though, quickly expands from babies at birth to children as old as 17 who are living in institutionalized settings. And that program soon turns into what is called the T4 program, which some of you probably have heard of the T4 program, um, where there are a set of uh, institutions around the country um, and these institutions are essentially transformed. They're, they're psychiatric hospitals largely um, that are transformed into killing centers. All of the institutional, uh, institutionalized patients in the country are to be evaluated by the local institutional director who has to fill out a form about whether that person will ever be able to work again, um, whether that person is Jewish, 
Um, if you are Jewish in this program, you are automatically marked for death. If you are not Jewish in this program, you are marked for death if you aren't going to be productive. Can't work. This is uh, tragic in so many ways, one of which is there are physicians who ran these centers, uh, the institutions who sometimes thought that if they said the patient would be able to work, they'd be sent to a work camp. And so they exaggerated the illness of the individual, which of course, led them to be sent to these special treatment centers. Patients who were sent to these centers um, would be uh, stripped down, sent in to what looked like a shower. The shower was in fact a gas chamber. They would be killed by gassing, their dental gold would be removed, and then they would be cremated in specially designed high volume crematory ovens. And if that sounds familiar to you, of course it should. Because the crematory technology, the camouflage techniques to get people to walk right into a chamber of death, these are things that were developed and perfected, if you will, in the T4 program before the death camps of the Reinhardt and uh, Auschwitz had started to use any of these techniques. There is a moment in 1941, so again, just before the Holocaust per se, the death camps had, were not yet up and running. And this T4 program becomes known. Um, it's a secret program. It's a clandestine program, illegal under German law. These are murders, right? These are not people asking for help. And assisted dying, by the way, was not legal in Germany. So all of this is illegal. It's a secret program, but it quickly becomes an open secret. There are bits of hair falling from the sky in these towns where the crematory ovens are operating. The children in the towns are terrified of the building on the hill. The parents are, you know, talking about it like it's the boogeyman. That kind of thing is why it becomes increasingly widespread. There are articles about this in the American press about the T4 program and Germany killing its disabled population. Um, and some church leaders, a few church leaders, start to speak out against it. And Hitler is a dictator in a terror state, but he does care about public opinion. And so Hitler himself in August of 1941 calls a halt to the T4 program. And at this point, the program has killed about 70,000 people. And when you call a halt to this program, you put about 100 people out of work. Those people have proven to be loyal. They can run a clandestine program. They know the technology. They are many of them medical professionals, nurses and doctors who know what they're dealing with, with the gases and so on. And so those people are in large part transferred to build and run the Reinhardt camps of Treblinka, Belzic, and Sobibor. Uh, these are images that were just uncovered a couple of years ago um, of one of the personnel who was in, pictured on the left here um, at one of the uh, T4 camps and then on the right in his role at Belzic, I believe. A man named Hans Munch, sorry, Hans Munch, um, a man named Imfred Eberl, Dr. Imfred Eberl was trained in the T4 program and becomes the first commandant at Treblinka. Treblinka uh, is the death camp uh, outside of, uh, of Warsaw. It's where the Warsaw ghetto is to be liquidated. 900,000 Jews are killed at Treblinka. So the connections between the T4 program, the eugenics programs, and the Holocaust are not a straight line. It's not, you know, a path that was laid out in advance and everyone knew exactly where it was going or anything like that. And yet it is very hard not to see the connections between the eugenics ideology and the T4 technology and personnel 
and the tricks that they developed to get people to walk into a gas chamber, all of that. Um, and and the, the the pathway that that they were that they were on. Let me back up for just a minute and talk about the German medical community in particular, because you might think, based on this story, uh, that they were sort of set up, um, that they were ethically corrupt to begin with, um, that they were backwards, and unfortunately, none of that is true. In fact, one of the great ironies of the Nuremberg doctors' trial is that when they were seeking evidence about the standards for conducting research on human beings, they went looking for written standards on research ethics for medical human subjects research. And they found only two examples. Both were German. The US had no written standards on research on human beings. These were written in Germany because a guy named Albert Neisser, whose name might be familiar if you uh, know Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisser had done experiments with uh, children and orphans uh, where he intentionally infected them with syphilis in order to test out different treatments. And when the public in Prussia found out about this, they were outraged and the Prussian parliament passed a set of standards that required the unambiguous consent of any human subject of medical research. Similar standards were then adopted across the entire Weimar Republic, including things that look very similar to an IRB that we have today in the US, but we did not have any of this, the Nazis did. Nazi scientists were also uh, at the top of the world with regard to um, science and technology. This is the Siemens electron microscope. Um, the electron microscopy was developed in Germany. If you want just one um, fact about this that is most illustrative, it may be that in the 10 years prior to the war, German or German speaking scientists won six of the 10 years in the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Can you imagine if the US won six out of 10 Nobel Prizes in a decade? So they were the world's preeminent medical superpower. If you wanted um, advanced training in heart surgery, you went to Germany. This was where um, the American medical education system had been completely revamped in 1915, 1910, around the Flexner Report. Flexner's report bases the American medical education system on the German model of medical education. But Germany is not backwards, and they take this advanced knowledge and they apply it to public policy. So this is one of the early studies looking at cancer among smokers and non-smokers. Um, they use this to develop programs to encourage women to do breast self-examination. Uh, this is, would be you know, a poster hung up like on buses and so on, decades before we had similar things in the US. They encourage women to have babies. They so abortion is illegal in Germany at the, under the Nazis. Um, they encourage women to have healthy babies by not drinking and not smoking. In fact, they bar smoking in party offices and many other public places. And they force everyone to go to genetic counseling, essentially, before you can get married. So you have to determine that you're a fit match. And all of this is framed around um, science, medicine, public health, but infused with economics and infused with nationalism, right? It's, in, it's, it's, it's racism for certain, it's eugenics for certain, but it's also about nationalism and it's about um, economics. This is from a high school techno a biology textbook, but this has nothing to do with biology, right? This is about the social cost of caring for people with congenital disabilities of whatever type those people have. 
presumed to have. The Nazis are um, very overt about this sort of medicalization. Um, this is an early image, 1935, of Adolf Hitler calling himself the doctor of the German people. Hitler uh, famously or infamously said that he was the one who discovered that Jewish people were the tubercle bacillus of society. It had to be eradicated. There was a, a Nazi doctor, Fritz Klein, after the war. Um, he was at Auschwitz, and one of the people talking to him after the war, uh, interviewing him, said, how could you have um, had so little compassion to have just killed these people? And he said, a doctor's job is, and I'm paraphrasing here, but a doctor's job is to get rid of the purulent appendix. The Jews are the purulent appendix of the body of Europe. So this medicalization of the language and of murder is, a, is an integral part of the Nazi paradigm. And it's part of why medical personnel became so rapidly enmeshed and involved and took leadership roles in the Nazi regime. Um, there were, a no and by the way, I partly put this up uh, because I want to emphasize this is not just doctors. Nurses were the primary defendants at the Hadamar trial. 62% um, of maxillofacial surgeons became Nazis. About half of doctors were Nazis, um, which, by the way, is considerably higher than other professional groups. Um, it's also important to notice 50% were not. So this was a choice. You didn't have to be a member of the Nazi party, but half of doctors chose to join the Nazi party. And there have been a lot of theorizing about why it is that health professionals were so in, ingrained and attracted to the Nazi regime. Part of it undoubtedly is the framing in eugenics and applied biology, as they called it, the idea that you could use your medical skills to make the whole world a better place. Some of it was about um, the fact that at this time, while the physician community is well regarded internationally, there is um, physician unemployment in the post-World War I era, right? The post-World War I is hard on Germany. So there's actual doctor, there are doctors without a job and there are Jewish doctors who are disproportionately represented in the profession and who have plum jobs so if they all get kicked out, those jobs open up. So there are a bunch of reasons, all probably hold some degree of truth about why the health professional community was so involved in this. Um, but part of it also is this medicalization, right? And I, I'll just illustrate this, and I apologize, this is a difficult image to, to view, um, but I wanna, I wanna use this killing pit image to get at something a, a, a little deeper, which uh, I'm gonna talk about Treblinka. This is not the killing pit at Treblinka. There are no known photographs of Treblinka. Um, but Treblinka was built outside of Warsaw in a rural area. It was built as though it were a train station with charts on the wall about when trains are coming and going and images of vacation spots so that the people coming in on the cattle cars would believe they were arriving at a community. There was also at one side, a door with a red cross over it, looking like an infirmary. But in fact, this was a facade. It led to the killing pit, which is where they would take prisoners who were too weak to get all the way to the gas chamber. And you know, Germans, are meticulous record keepers. So they would record when someone was taken to the killing pit. And what was written in the records is the patient was cured with one pill. From that level of medicalized language and thought around murder, it's not that hard to see the more iconic um, roles of health professionals in this process. So this is 
perhaps the, the most well-known role of doctors at Auschwitz, which is ramp duty. Um, doctors, dentists, pharmacists also sometimes took ramp duty. Uh, this was the duty where you would assign people to either go directly to the gas chamber or to be set aside and warehoused for labor or for experimentation or other cruelties. There is no record of any doctor or anyone else actually being punished for refusing to participate in ramp duty. There's only one person that I know of who did, a guy named Hans Munch. He's a complicated character, but um, this was all voluntary on the part of the physicians involved. I'm gonna show you two images now that um, are cartoons, but in some ways I think they may be the most disturbing images um, before we close. Um, you might be surprised to learn that one of the first proclamations of the Third Reich was to bar vivisection in animal experiments. So this has the lab animals of Germany saluting Hermann Goring because uh, in August of 1933, he had said he would commit to a concentration camp anyone who thought they could treat animals as though they were inanimate objects without feelings. And if you know how this history plays out, you really have to wonder, so what do they think of Jewish people and others who end up being the, the subjects of such heinous experiments? And the answer is here. Here, scientific gaze of the microscope looks down on the petri dish of society. Here, people have become pathogens. So with, with that history, what do we do, right? What, what is our obligation? Um, we have an obligation of remembrance. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful quote from uh, the director of the museum about how this museum is different um, because it's also about understanding how we got to the present and it's about how using this knowledge to build a better future. How do we do that with this history? And I think that whenever someone talks about contemporary implications of the Holocaust, the first place they go is the, is the legacy and research ethics. That because of the Holocaust, we now have research IRBs and research ethics infrastructure that prevents us from doing terrible experiments on unknowing, unwitting, unconsenting adults, et cetera. Unfortunately, this is probably the area where the Holocaust had had the least immediate impact. As it turns out, um, Andrew Ivey went to the, as, a, as the representative for the American Medical Association, goes to the trial, in 1946 and quickly realizes that they're gonna be talking about research ethics and the AMA says nothing about research ethics in any of its policies. So he runs back and in December of 1946, he convinces the AMA board of trustees to put a statement about research ethics into the record. And this is it. The defendants were well represented. They realized what had happened, that this was not a longstanding policy, that this was a rapidly implemented policy put in there for the purposes of the trial. So it didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was influence the trial. And it also didn't influence American medical behaviors. Um, the Nuremberg Code, which comes out of the trial and which requires the consent of human beings who are subjects of medical research, is essentially ignored across the board in the U.S. Um, and there are doctors, you know, quoted as saying things like, this was a code written for Nazi monsters. It was not written for us. It's not pertinent to or adequate for medical research in the United States. And so we have a trial, we have a set of ethical standards for human subjects research that come out of it. And for 25 years, we continue the Tuskegee study. 
And it's the revelations of the Tuskegee study that lead to congressional investigations and the Belmont report and the common rule and the reason we have because we couldn't learn from the Nazis. So let me give you a couple er other areas where I think this history can be illuminating, but it does not provide easy answers. Um, doctors have conflicting loyalties, as do all of us, by the way. That's not unique to medicine. It's true of every one of us. We have responsibilities and obligations in one domain of our lives, and we have other responsibilities in other domains, and we have to figure out how to bring those together and, and orchestrate a life. But with physicians it's, and nurses and others, it's quite common for us to have to make decisions about the well being of the one person sitting in front of us as balanced against the well being of the rest of the community. And it could be as simple as, you know, I'd like to keep talking with you, but I have other patients waiting. That is a rationing decision where I'm taking your interests and sub and putting them down compared to the interests of other patients. So we may, that's tiny, right? I understand, but, the, but it, you can think of them at every level, all the way up to you know, crisis standards of care conversations in the pandemic and who gets the last ventilator type conversations, right? We are stuck in this position of having to sometimes weigh the well being of the one and the well being of the others. That is uncomfortable. And the Nazi experience gives us some illumination of what happens when we go way too far in the direction of I only care about the well being of the Volk. And as Karl Brandt put it, I am happy to destroy this aggregation of a trillion cells in the form of some human beings, if it prevents harm to the larger Volk. Um, how do we think about attractive new scientific theories? Right, like when a new technology comes along, when a new theory comes along, and here again, it's a balancing act, right? We don't want to keep our minds so open that our brains fall out, as my mom used to say, right? We want to keep an open mind. Science progresses because people don't believe the conventional wisdom. They're not willing to accept the conventional wisdom. They prove each other wrong. So science progresses because we question each other. And yet, you know, climate science, vaccine science, at some point, you have to say something is real and it is worth making policy around this. But we also don't want a repeat of eugenics where we made policies and practices that turned out to be incredibly wrongheaded. Oh, by the way, just give you one um, thing. I think we're probably closing in on time. Um, you may be wondering, so why doesn't eugenics work? Um, and the answers are myriad, um, but it doesn't. In Germany, literally, I think I'm using that word accurately, every person with schizophrenia was either killed or sterilized. And within 20, 30 years, Germany had the same number of people with schizophrenia as every other country in the world. You, you can't take a non-genetic or even something that has some genetic component and breed it out of the population. It just doesn't work. Um, what about, what lessons does this history hold for self-regulation? We did a terrible job after the war. A few people were prosecuted. Some people who were Nazis ended up the one, the president of the World Medical Association. Another almost became the president of the World Medical Association before the AMA and the Israeli Medical Association figured out who he was and, and 
you know, mounted a campaign to prevent it from happening. And by the way, that was, this is like within our lifetime. That was just before I joined the AMA that the severing affair took place. That was 1993. How do we hold each other accountable? This, you know, very present today when we have people peddling quack cures with an MD and a license. What responsibility do we have for holding up standards? And what level of proof does there need to be in order to uphold that standard, right? What if we were wrong about something and we punish someone for doing something that turns out they were right all along? You can imagine that. But you can also imagine a world in which we don't have any standards. And in that case, what's the point of having the profession? And I'll, I'll close with this one, which I, I think is, um, is, it is challenging. And again, the Nazi experience does not answer this question, but we train people to lose their empathy. Almost inevitably, because if you want to be in this profession, you have to learn how to be with someone who is suffering, who's in pain. And then five minutes later, you have to be with a new person and not let that experience affect the interaction you're having with this new person. That, create, that hardens you to some degree. How do we create health professionals who are good at their job and who retain a, a big bolus of human empathy? And I think we do this through things like arts, the humanities, narrative, storytelling, poetry, sharing, talking, right, debriefing, talking about the moral aspects of our work. But we don't have the full answer to this. We still have doctors and nurses who become hardened and inured to human suffering and, and in the end, cruel. And we're creating them. So on a health science campus like this, I think we have to take that responsibility seriously. And I'll end with this slide, which is a quote from Robert Proctor, the Holocaust historian, about the need to be able to learn lessons um, from this history. And he talks only about our ability to understand the origins in this quote, but I'll just add to that. It's also because knowing how the medical profession and its ethics were shifted and changed and brought to a new place by the Nazis, that holds lessons for how to evolve our medical ethics today to make it better or to make it worse. And for us to have those conversations about what our ethics ought to look like, because in the end, they're not immutable. This history proves it. We are in charge of our ethics in every generation. And the questions that we have to answer about this history are not as simple as how did a few monsters come up from the depths and infect the larger medical community? It, it's really how did the most advanced industrialized nation on earth and most of its health professionals turn from healers to killers together? and not in spite of their professional ethics, but in the name of science and medicine and public health. I know we don't have time, we never have time for questions, but we are gonna have a 90 minute conversation. So uh, we'll do one in the room, and then I don't know if we have them on the couple. <laughs> Can you use the microphone just because we have people online? Just one quick question, Matt. Um, so much of what spoke to me in your talk was finding a sense of balance. So within that context, can you speak to the CRISPR case in China? Yeah. And why that caused such outrage? Yeah, I mean, so 
Not a quick question, <laughs> but yeah. So for those who are uh, who may not have followed this news, a couple of years ago, uh, just pre-pandemic, um, a, a scientist who had training in the U.S. at some top institutions uh, went back home and decided that he ought to create a genetically modified set of twin babies um, who would have a genetic change that would make them a little bit more resistant if they were ever to be exposed to HIV infection. Um, there are many reasons why he ended up in jail for this um, in China. He's now out of jail, I believe, recently. Um, but uh, he, there, were no, there were, weren't exactly laws against it, but there was an international consensus that this technology was not ready for use in human beings, that there are mutations that might have occurred that were not the one he was trying to create, so-called off-target mutations, um, that we don't have generations of data from animal models yet on how this might play out. Um, so there are ways in which CRISPR is being used to make modifications to human cells and then have those cells be reinfused into someone. But here he was taking a germline cell, which means this modification affects not just these two children, but all of their subsequent generations. And that feels like a bigger deal. Um, than you know, some of the other uses, which seem like we should get those right first, right? So using CRISPR to address um, sickle cell disease, that feels like, you know, let's, let's figure it out with something like that. Taking a perfectly healthy baby and trying to modify its genomic uh, characteristics to make it less susceptible to HIV just, you know, for, for many people, that was a, a step way too far, way too soon. So it does get to this question of, you know, where, where are we in our belief in the science and our, and our risk taking with other human beings who, and obviously, it doesn't have to be said, these babies don't get a chance to consent to this, obviously.